Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And this is the podcast for August 30th, 2020, the 13th Sunday after Pentecost this year. The first reading, the thematic first reading is Jeremiah 15, 15 through 21. The semi-continuous Old Testament reading is Exodus 3, 1 through 15. Uh, the Psalm is Psalm 26, 1 through 8. Continuing in Romans 12, we have Romans 12, 9 through 21. And continuing in Matthew 16, it's uh, verses 21 through 28. So last week we had Peter's confession. And in Matthew's words, you know, you are the rock upon whom I'll build my church. Whatever you loose uh, or bind, is uh, that's what happens. And now it continues as Jesus and Matthew says, begins to show his disciples that he must go uh, up to Jerusalem, which is slightly different terminology than uh, Mark uses, but it is, uh, to me, it's he's teaching them what it means to, that he is Messiah. Yes, good point, Rolf. <laughs> so, uh, and as we talked about, I think last week that this is the, uh, this is the, first of uh what four um four four passion predictions is that correct right first of four get one in 17 one well we get one in 17 one in 20 and then if you count 26 two maybe i don't know but uh but uh the but yeah this is a significant moment and this idea of of denying yourself uh, and then taking up your cross, I think, are are one of those uh, or losing and losing your life for my sake. I mean, I think it's one of those it's one of those passages that gets really uh, really muddled uh, in terms of what does it mean to deny to deny yourself. Uh, and I I want to put that back into uh, the context of Matthew in particular, or in the context of, of what is it, what is it that this discipleship is, is calling us to a kind of living uh, that is, that is calling us to, and to deny yourself is to, to not like deny your being, <laughs> uh, but it's, but what is it that hinders you? What is it that prevents you from, from, uh, from the kind of living to which, or the kind of way of being in the world that uh that that jesus has talked about since the very beginning of this gospel with the sermon on the mount because now we're this is when things are really going to start making a difference and and so what is it that hinders you from of this this kind of uh sermon on the mount kind of living salt of the earth light of the world uh and this kind of sermon on the mount sort of commitment uh, I think that's one way that I would maybe unpack uh, denying denying oneself because again, I think this passage gets really confusing for people. What does that actually mean? Caroline, I, re I appreciate the um, context setting in the text because uh, in light of current realities, I'm really in front of the text when I'm reading this this week. And um, the idea of denial of self, for me, I, I read it um, uh, a kind of uh, as an analogy of denying the systems that make me think I know who I am. And so I'm going to use the word I've used the last few weeks of dismantling those systems, um, that to deny what is familiar, uh, what is comfortable, what is the categories we're used to uh, in order to see um, the righteousness of God, to, to see what the inbreaking of Christ means. So in Matthew, it was healing, it was teaching that was new lessons, uh, it was uh, understanding um, all the, the the things that they thought they understood of Moses and who they were as the children of Abraham all over again. Um, and what would it mean for the church today uh, to um, dismantle everything we're familiar with in order to understand what God has been doing all along? And I 
bring that to a hopeful statement of, uh, of, of the verse 28, um, where um, Jesus says, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And I want that to be a moment that says we have to dismantle the systems so that people today can glimpse the kingdom of God. And it not always be the hope that this is going to happen in the future, but that a glimpse of it can be seen today. I suppose one of the reminders for that is about what makes it difficult is that it's, well, it's satanic according to this, that the systems themselves, the propensities are satanic. If we look back, one of the problems is the NRSV splits this passage into two different sections and read the two paragraphs connected. So what is self-denial or what makes self-denial difficult? Well, in many ways, what Peter is suggesting to Jesus is an example of kind of an anti-self-denial, right? As a refusal to let Jesus be who he has to be, which Jesus shockingly characterizes as demonic. But then as well, it's this difference between divine things and human things. It's this this weird, beautifully ambiguous phrase of human stuff versus divine stuff. And it's not that divine stuff is self-giving and human stuff is selfish, but there is a sense in which what he calls human things are where we push up against what God would have or would want. And, and where, the, where the Satan language is helpful to me here, and it's mostly unhelpful to me here, to be honest, but where it's helpful to me here is it's a reminder of that systemic rootedness um, and embodiment and how that's more than just the sum of my own bad choices from day to day, but it's part of the water I swim in. How to break out of that is probably, well, you need a cross um, as part of it, as part of the solution here. But this idea of self-denial as, as a corporate thing that we all participate in because we're removing ourselves from a corporate understanding of what does it mean to be human, what does it mean to have rights, and investing that into a new society, a new social understanding of what that looks like as the people who follow Jesus to the cross. So I think I'm agreeing with everything you said, Joy. I'm just also kind of setting it into a communal setting and as well a, a Christological or a, really a cruciform, a cross-shaped setting too. I should have let you speak first, Matt. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, no, we're better together. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, uh, I think that uh, you know these two passages from last week and this week obviously go together, uh, which is that's one of the reasons I'm, it's unfortunate they're split. But I like contrasting Peter as the rock upon whom I build the church with the stumbling block, so that Peter can be both rock and stumbling block. I mean that. Uh, Wish I'd thought about this last week uh, for visual preachers uh, to uh, set up that contrast. And so I do think that that is that is the nature of being a follower of of Jesus is that we, uh, I mean, to use very Lutheran language, we are um, justified and sanctified, fully justified and sanctified, and at the same time still fully sinner. Um, it's not half and half; it's hundred percent, hundred percent, and that um, so that. There finally is no way for us to put away the the words you guys are using, the satanic ways of thinking, the the, the ways of. I really wish this had been uh, with last week's Romans twelve text rather than this one. That is to be conformed to the world, because uh, the, the world is always pressuring us and, and trying to conform us to its satanic ways of thinking, um, and yet the dying to self and rising to new life and being transformed by the mercies of God are also constant. Well, and, and in, in this context uh, that we've been discussing, the, that the idea of then saving your life, uh, what is that, you know, for those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their, lose their life for my sake will find it. Again, it's one of those sort of muddled passages or, passage, or verses that can be taken out of context, I think, and really um, in, in very unhelpful ways uh, when we think about, uh, when we think particularly of persons who have uh, 
or persons who have been told that this is what a, a denial of self, uh, this is your cross to bear, those kinds of, of ways in which this, these passages have turned into exceedingly unhelpful, uh, unhelpful uh, pieces of advice, so-called pieces of advice. But that to saving yourself, again, uh, and what we've been talking about with with the dismantling of of satanic systems, saving yourself would be saving your self interests. Uh, you know, the system. I might want to dismantle the system, but the system has really worked for me. So I'm just gonna, you know, keep. I'm gonna keep, keep, keep it, keep propping it up. Uh, and and it's and it's it's in part recognizing that those systems are definitely self-serving and definitely serve our self-interest. And as you said, Rolf, it means going back to having that it, it, that uh, Beatitudes perspective, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so saving your life is this hungering for, uh, and thirsting for righteousness that, that, uh, that means you do have to get up, up your self-interest because it's not just about you. Uh, it's for the sake of the kingdom of God and for the sake of who, have you said, Joy, who has been left out of that, of, of that kingdom? And, uh, and so I, that's, I think that's another, uh, given what we've all said, that's another direction I think that would be helpful for people for to unpack again that phrase of what does that actually, what does that actually mean in the context of Matthew? Wow, there can be some good preaching this week. Let's shift to uh, Jeremiah, the, the thematic Old Testament lesson. And uh, this is one of Jeremiah's uh, laments, uh, his, one of his complaint songs, uh, which I suspect is here simply because of uh, Jesus is showing the disciples that he's going to have to undergo uh, great sufferings. I'm not sure um, how much more to go into it. You know, it says, know that on your account, I suffer insult. I think that's the link. And so you could take it as some sort of uh, prophetic stance in that way, or um, you could talk about the, the sufferings of the one who does set aside their own self-interest for the sake of the call uh, to follow Christ in daily life. But also it's a text you could just preach on its own if this is where your congregation, your community is right now needing some, some words of lament. I could see it in conversation with Romans 12, whether or not the lectionary committee designed that or not, we can, we have the freedom to do stuff like that. Uh, I do love that line in verse 18, where Jeremiah says, you are to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail. Some people need to be invited into that kind of honesty with God because they don't, they've never been given permission to say that. I've said that about people. I still shake a little bit when I say that to God, but if I'm being honest, I can and will. It's, just, well, it's a beautiful image, first of all, but second of all, just to, just to model that and to think about who this is modeling it. Uh, and most of our listeners know this, you know the power of lament, but don't, don't think that everybody in your, in your congregation has been introduced to that. I really appreciate that because we do have to remember that there's somebody hearing that permission for the first time and we have to offer it because you can't get to the um, you can't get to the to the sense of what Christ has done for us if you can't name what you need from Christ uh, and and so um, yeah being able to um, deeply complain, to lament, um, to join in this weeping prophet's way of crying all the time is the only way that you can get um, a sense of recognizing just what it is that, that Christ has done for us. It is, uh, it is an interesting image. Uh, in Hebrew, it's just like false water that can't be trusted is what it says. Uh, you know, and I don't know if that is that is, you think you can drink it so it's not potable, or if uh, you, you think it's not deep, so you go into it and then you fall in. I, I, I don't exactly know uh, what that is like, but either way, I mean, I, I really like um, inviting people into to say, having an experience of God uh, 
that is not uh, redeeming and complaining to God about it is part of the, is part of the spiritual life. But if you want to, if, if you're in the semi-continuous Old Testament uh, pathway, now you got one of the heavyweight but really difficult passages uh, to handle in the entire Old Testament. So if you're telling the story of the Old Testament you, uh, by now uh, in the summer, you realize that you've got a lot of filling in between um, the, t the, the, the timbers on the barnwood building that are being rebuilt are wide and you got a lot of filling in to do. So last week we had the great story of the five brave women um, through whom God starts to move to free the people. And now you got to do the, um, uh, that's, and then Moses of course uh, is born and saved, but now Moses has uh, had to flee because he's a murderer and he is, uh, he's married now, he's married somebody and he's up, uh, he's up on the mountain and uh, God, uh, God appears to him and um, in the burning shrubbery that is not consumed and then reveals, uh, calls God and then reveals God's name. So there's so much here. Uh, which parts of it do you guys want to land on? I like the, uh, when we think about, you know, this, I think, people's imagination around this passage has to do, you know, it, it, how they imagine their own call from God or their own sort of sense of what God is calling them to do. And I, uh, I, I, I like to think of this. Well, one, one direction that I thought about with this passage is just sort of the, the flow, the flow of call narratives, <laughs> which are, or the flow of our, our own call, which is, you know this commissioning from God uh, for a you know for a particular task or whatever. But then there's you know the what will always follow afterward is rejection <laughs> or excuses, <laughs> uh, you know, and and which you see in in the prophets as well, right? But then reassurance of G, of God being with the with with the called person, and that I will be with you is the reassurance of presence, but it's not a reassurance of 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 success necessarily uh, to what I have called you to do. And so, uh, I I think that's where I would land is that that as we imagine sort of our own, um, and it's just a good time to think about this with our own calling. What 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 is it God? What is it that God is calling us to do and be for the sake of God's kingdom in the world? That um, to reflect on that, to re reflect on that flow of call, of commission, rejection, and reassurance um, is is a direction I would take. I had a um, a student uh, of mine who was a, a Methodist pastor from Ireland um, um, uh, preach this text and. Uh, the focus that I remember uh, of it was uh, the naming of God, of, of God being um, who God is. And uh, it was interesting because he was, he was, um, he was explaining it to um, a group of Baptist pastors um, from the American South. And he was saying that in their context of what we might call the Bible Belt, um, there was this sense of familiarity with this story uh, of, of, of God being God and God being good. But in his context, um, there was this desire for the goodness and liberation that this text is leading to. Um, but in Ireland, uh, because of the, the uh, war, the Protestant Catholic war there, uh, the religion is the worst place to think that liberation is going to come. And uh, it was it was a real powerful reminder of speaking to the context you're in and um, rec having folks recognize that familiarity may not be um, may not be the safest ground for interpreting this text, that we need to experience the uh, background that you put up, uh, Ralph, and the reality of accepting that you've put up, Caroline, um, but to help folks experience the awe of this moment of God showing up at the end of the day, 
right in the ordinariness and then saying, I've got this promise and this promise is liberating for the people that you know need liberation the most. I think if you're filling in, that's really important stuff. I, but I wanna set one more piece of context in all of this, if you're filling in all these gaps. Later on in Exodus, we learn this is 400 years. Is that correct? Since, since Joseph, now to Moses. That's what Exodus says. And again, in Acts, it's, it's mentioned. So who knows exactly how many. But this is more than just one generation. And so when God says to Moses, uh, I have, I just lost my spot. I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver. I would have preferred four years as opposed to 400. You know, there, there's a, and I, we just talked about lament and that's a different passage that doesn't really pair with this one. But again, to think about that sense of liberation that, that Joy was just expressing as well, coming after a time when probably most people had thought it, they even still had a memory of the God of Joseph and his, his ancestors, that that God was long gone. Yeah, the, um, the, the, in Exodus, the, the, the generation of oppression is, is essentially one, one generation of oppression. Because like last week, so you got a, a, the new king who knew not Joseph arises, and then he really puts the people into uh, the oppression. It, it doesn't make it any better because it's still years. Uh, so I, I would add verses again, as we are, uh, want to do as adders, because at the end of Exodus 2 is this really important phrase. After a long time, the king of Egypt dies. So that, that Pharaoh who oppressed them, that Moses had to flee from, uh, he dies. And then it says they groan in their slavery. And out of slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. It doesn't even say that they were praying to God, just that their groans God heard. And then the God responds. Um, and then God does you know, from a human perspective, the stupidest thing he could ever do. He takes an escaped, uh, an escaped felon and says, you know what, you're the one that's going to go back and free the people. And so Moses has three reasons. Uh, you know, uh, some of the other prophets who are called, they, they have one excuse, Isaiah, I'm a sinner, Jeremiah, I'm too young, you know, others, um, you know, Peter or whatever, you know, different folks. Moses tries three times. Um, and uh, God's first offering of a sign is really unhelpful. Um, here, this will be a sign to you uh, for, so you to know that this call is real. After you've succeeded, you can worship me. You know, it's like, how about let's have some, you know, some more impressive than that, you know. Uh, but then finally, the gift of the name is such a big deal. And um, one of the comment, there's many commentaries on this on our website. I, I point people to, especially to, to an old commentary by Dennis, um, Dennis Olson and one by Terry Fretheim uh, to, to kind of get into some of the name uh, and a reminder that the name is so holy in Judaism that it is not to be spoken. And, uh, and in, for some of my Jewish uh, scholar friends, it is not even to be translated. So they object, even if you translate it, I am who I am, or, or the other, I will be who I will be. In some way, the important thing is that it's related to the verb to be, and that what God causes to be is, uh, is what makes God, God. So later on in Exodus, it's interesting, uh, and this may be where I'd finally hang the hook. It says, you know, um, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, uh, God says later. And uh, God's, uh, God says, I will be who I will be and who am I, but I'm love and mercy and forgiveness. Um, and to me, that maybe is the most important thing about this enigmatic name of God is that God is known through God's benefits and what God's, God causes to come into being. Well, okay then. Let's let's move on to Romans, uh, which is this. Uh, this is a great um, this Romans text 
is, uh, you know, it's not as theologically uh, deep as some of the other passages we've had, but it's got all these sort of staccato bullet points. Like, it feels like uh, this is a, Paul should have put this in a PowerPoint with all these, you know, love, love is genuine, hate what's evil, hold fast to what's good, love one another, you know, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, all these things. It's, uh, I don't know if what you do is you finally say, here's a picture of what it is to be transformed by the mercies of God uh, and not conform to the world, um, you know, extend hospitality to others um, and so on. I especially have always liked, uh, because I teach the Psalms and you get the Psalms of vengeance the, where they want to, uh, where they want vengeance on those who have caused them to, to be oppressed. I've, I've always, in that text, always come back to this text, beloved, never avenge yourselves, leave room for the wrath of God, vengeance is mine. And the point isn't that God is just a God of vengeance, but rather we are not to take vengeance, um, but to leave, to leave that up to God. We like to talk about using things liturgically, and here's a text that is, of course, used liturgically quite a bit. And certain passages, when they show up in the lectionary, become helpful opportunities to teach people where our liturgy comes from. So I'm sure all of you know, a lot of reform services will end with a charge of some kind, and, and some of the traditional charges are drawn from this text, but to help people get a sense for where that comes from, not just these are good ideas, not, these, not that this is fortune cookie advice, but this comes out of Paul's description of what does a living sacrifice kind of life look like? Uh, what does it mean to practice the self-denial that Jesus talks about, and which Calvin calls the sum of the Christian life, that that this is partly what it looks like. That's not just not an aspirational idea that we hold in our heads, but it's again lived out in concrete steps that are moment by moment decisions that we make. That what is happening here is not the kinds of um, ecclesial practices of fasting or devotional reading practices, but they are in the world acts of kindness, mercy, righteousness, how we treat our neighbor, um, our willingness to, I'll say it again, dismantle the systems that oppress. Uh, it, it's not simply praying to God, but it is being the answer to our prayers um, for someone else.